Good afternoon again. My name is Leslie Wellman, and I'm the Hood Foundation Curator of Education here at the Hood Museum of Art. And it is my immense pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to moderate this panel on co-curricular student engagement. As you look at the slide that's up on the screen right now, you might be saying to yourself, I thought this panel was called extracurricular student engagement. And you would be right, because originally it was. But as Michael mentioned during his welcoming remarks yesterday, one of our goals in hosting this conference was to have another type of opportunity to engage with and learn from our colleagues at college and university museums around the country. And as I spoke with colleagues, the words extracurricular, non-curricular, and co-curricular were all used to reference ways of engaging with students outside of the classroom or outside of the formal curriculum. Then, as the five of us on this panel engaged in conference calls and more in-depth discussions of our work in this realm, we agreed that extra and non-curricular made the nature or type of student engagement our museums are doing somehow sound a little less than or kind of like an add-on, and it, it almost felt as if it devalued it somehow. We also realized in the course of our conversations that what might once have been or have, and have been described as extracurricular student engagement has evolved in interesting ways and in today's practice, as you'll soon hear, is not necessarily always separate from curricular engagement and indeed sometimes is intertwined with it and other times is actually not even differentiated from it. So hence uh, the change uh, in the title of this session. And I just wanted to refer to um, this morning, one of our panelists, uh, Kenji, a Dartmouth student, when he presented, um, he spoke at length about the Museum Collecting 101 course that he participated in the museum. Then he became an intern. He helped co-curate the exhibition, Looking Back at Earth. And he told us a little bit about the career track that he is um, planning to explore. And I think that's a wonderful example of the substantive engagement that students can have. Not a single thing that Kenji described this morning was for college credit. So that would all fall under the realm of co-curricular. I feel extremely fortunate to have had the opportunity to delve into the topic of co-curricular student engagement. In order to convene a panel, of course, I needed to do some research. So I began by looking at the websites of many college and university art museums across the country. And I have to say that alone was a really fascinating and informative experience. On some websites, college students and opportunities for ways that they could engage with the museum were very present. Sometimes they were so present that almost every photo that appeared, the things that were highlighted or described, and even the way the text was written said, this is a museum for college students. The sense of invitation to or even ownership of the museum by students was actually palpable. I would say that represented one end of the spectrum. On the other end, I found College Art Museum websites where even after clicking on every link and option that was available, I could identify little or no evident opportunity for student co-curricular engagement. It raised the question in my mind as to whether museum websites are accurately expressing all of the opportunities that we offer to college students and what messages we're sending to students through our websites. The next step in my research was to talk with colleagues at campus-based museums across the country. And I want to extend my deep gratitude to all of the people who spent time with me on the phone and then many people often followed up by emailing or mailing me materials after we had our conversations. From these conversations, I learned of diverse models of engagement that include everything from student gallery guides, interns, and paid and volunteer student workers to student membership organizations, advisory panels, and art societies, and collaborations or partnerships with student groups. Examples of specific engagements included student curated exhibitions, museum interventions, writing competitions inspired by art, student blogs, innovative use of social media to connect with students, and often that was also to generate attendance at student events cafes and staying open late um, to attract students, interim courses, student labels, and different kinds of electronic interactives, such as touch screens on which passersby could create forms of art or learn about art.
The types of programs that I learned about for students included evenings for students, study nights and study breaks at museums, parties, studio programs and classes, various models of student presentations and student-to-student -student programs, acquisitions programs, uh, where students would select a work of art to be purchased by a museum, and a frame conservation course that we'll hear a little bit more about later. Some programs are student organized, and some are overseen by museum staff. Some of the things that I list, that I just read off on my list, many different museums do, while others are less common or even unique to a particular institution. Our four panelists were invited to pre present because their institutions stood out to me as leaders in student co-curricular engagement. And I want to interest, introduce them now in the order that they'll present. And they, as you look at them, I'm, I'm, I'm introducing them left to right as you uh, see them sitting before you. So Julie McLean, who is the Associate Educator for School and Family Programs at the Smith College Museum of Art. Lisa Borgsdorf, Manager of Public Programs and Campus Engagement at the University of Michigan Museum of Art who very graciously agreed to step in on short notice uh, when her colleague Ruth Slavin was not able to join us. Deborah Wild from uh, the Rhode Island School of Design Museum, and she is the Associate Educator Academic Programs there. And then Rachel Seligman, Assistant Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Franks Francis Young Tang Teaching Museum at Skidmore College. In addition to the fact that all four of the museums represented here do a significant amount of co-curricular student engagement, they also have very complementary models to share with us. And we spent a lot of time on our conference calls making sure that what Julie, Lisa, Deborah, Deborah and Rachel talk about today won't overlap. Each of the four museums they represent engages students in many different ways. In other words, they do lots of the things on that list that I enumerated. What each of the panelists will focus on today is only a very small selection of the programs and initi initiatives her museum undertakes to engage students outside the classroom. And I've, I've really asked them to focus um, in their remarks on what struck me as most distinct that each museum represented here does, rather than what is most common in museum practice. Each panelist will share examples of co-curricular student engagement, and as they do so, they will touch upon how these programs and initiatives relate to their museum's mission, how they measure success, and what the benefits of this engagement are. In essence, why do it? As they speak, I think you will find that the stories and ideas they share reflect the participatory, interactive approach to learning that resonates so strongly with today's college students. The last thing that I want to do before turning the podium over to Julie is to give all of you an assignment. You may have noticed in the program, the schedule for today, that instead of breakout, breakout sessions after this panel, we've designated 4 to 4.30 as a time for everyone to contribute ideas So on this, on this topic of co-curricular student engagement. So in addition to listening to what our four panelists are sharing this afternoon, please also listen for models or examples of co-curricular student engagement that they are not addressing. I ask you to do this because one goal of this session is for all of us to leave this room having heard about the most diverse range of co-curricular student engagement possible to inform and inspire all of our practice at all of our home institutions. As we are about to hear, the art museums at Smith, University of Michigan, RISD, and the Tang all do interesting and innovative work in this realm. But we know that many, many museums do too. And so we've built in this open mic time after our panelists speak. So when we get to that point, I'm just going to invite people from the audience. We'll have um, staff with microphones moving around, similar to after other sessions. And so I'll be inviting you to do descriptions of what you uh, do at your museum that hasn't been mentioned uh, so far. At this point, what we're going to do is we're all going to exit the stage so that we actually get to see each other's PowerPoints, <coughs> and we'll each speak from the podium. So uh, we'll head down, and then after each of us presents, we'll come back up here for questions and answers and subsequent discussion. So thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julie McLean from the Smith College Museum of Art, and I'm going to be talking to you about some examples of co-curricular engagement that we do with students at the Smith College Museum. So to start by telling you just a little bit about Smith College, it's a women's college, a smallish size, located in Northampton, Massachusetts. And the thing about Smith is there's a very um, strong sense of tradition there, and there's a very strong alumni network, especially in the field of art and museums. So there are many Smith women who are curators, directors, in the case of our director as well, dealers, collectors, etc. Um, to tell you a little bit about our museum, the collection was founded in the late 1800s, uh, simultaneously with the founding of the college. Um, we average around 35,000 visitors a year or so, and about 20% of those visitors are Smith students. And we have to attribute that number both to class visits and individual visits. In terms of staffing size, we have 25 or so regular staff plus additional um, security staff. There are five educators on our team, and we're actually all here today, and we work very collaboratively. And student staff is really vital to what we do. We could not do the things that we do without them. We have an, an average year around 25 student workers, work study, et cetera. And then an additional around 50 volunteers who participate both in ongoing programs, such as our tour guide program, which I'll talk about in a minute, and those who volunteer for other events and programs and things like that. So a little bit our, about our philosophy of co-curricular programming. So we sort of look at what we do in sort of two different prongs. Um, then looking at the museum as a site for experiential learning and then looking at the museum as a place where we, we choose to bring student voices into our process. So a, a hub for student uh, voices is what I'm calling it. And how does this tie into our mission? So broadly speaking, at the college, this is the first line of the college's mission. And it says, Smith College educates women of promise for lives of distinction. And I think at the museum, we, we think a lot about that lives piece um, in terms of what students will do with their lives, not only the careers that they'll have, but the contributions that they'll make to society. And then, more specifically, the museum's mission. So an integral part of Smith College and its mission, Smith College Museum of Art educates and engages our academic and broader communities through meaningful and memorable encounters with exceptional art. So what we've done is placed ourselves within the vision of the college, but we've deliberately placed the word academic first too, but included broader community because we really recognize our role as a cultural institution too within the region and see the importance of connecting students with the community. And so we really provide the opportunity for students to obtain hands-on experience in a working museum and to engage with the communities outside of Smith. And much of our co-curricular programming is about this, again, connection, whether it's um, a very direct connection, such as leading tours like you see here, or a less direct contact through things such as creating exhibitions or interpretive materials. So to get into some program examples, um, I'll talk about these five different examples of programs under these two sort of headings here. Um, and these programs provide, I think, introductions to particular aspects of the museum field and certain types of hands-on experience. They make the work of the museum a learning opportunity for students. So I'll start with the Student Museum Educator Program, which I should say now we refer to as SME. So I said to myself, remember to say that. Don't just come out and say the SME program <laughs> because no one will know what I'm talking about. So, and I'm sure everybody's museum probably has acronyms for the different things. So our SME program is our uh, volunteer student docent program. And I'll talk a little bit more about this one because it's, it's the one that I um, supervise in particular. So the SMEs, um, with that program, we provide them important teaching practice and interactions with the K through 12 community through tours and family programs for probably over an average of 4,000 or so kids per year. 
Um, students lead all of our public tours if they're not available. An education staff person fills in, but we don't have additional volunteer or paid docents. And this ME program serves as pre-professional training, really, for students who are interested in a variety of things, teaching, working with kids, improving their public speaking skills or confidence, and just all using art as the stimulus for that. And the program takes place over the course of the whole academic year. There's an average of around 20 students. Some are more active than others, and they attend weekly meetings at the museum, and then they sign up for an additional weekly volunteer slot, which we sort of call their office hours, where they come into our department office and complete assignments and readings about museum education, and they prepare for and lead tours during those office hours times. Um, and the training sessions throughout the year, they vary. They consist of a mix of the basics of leading tours, such as group management and tailoring the way that you would speak to different age groups, plus opportunities to meet with members of the museum staff outside of the education department. And students spend a lot of time in the galleries looking at thinking about and discussing art, both during the training sessions and on their own. The SMEs also serve as our family programs staff. They learn about how to run special events, how to interact with children and their caregivers from the campus, so children of faculty and staff that come to our events, and also community children. And I just want to take a moment here to note that there are certainly challenges with using only students to run school and family programs in terms of reliability and turnover and level of interest and experience. Um, but I would say that we accept those factors, accept those risks, because we really feel that it's most important to place the learning experience of the Smith students as a top priority and um, in terms of just all of our educational programming, really. And but with these challenges, I think, come really great successes, which I'll talk about um, at the end. So the second half of this pie of experiential learning is our frame conservation program. And this is an outgrowth of the museum's long-term effort to study and conserve the frames in our collection. And I should say both the SME program and frame conservation are long-standing programs at the museum. So the Frame Conservation Program is also a volunteer program. It combines an introduction to conservation theory and practice with hands-on experience restoring a frame or sometimes multiple frames. And students occasionally treat objects as well from the permanent collection. They work as apprentices in our on-site conservation lab with the chief preparator. And there are around 13 or so students involved each year, and they volunteer an average of 15 to 20 hours per week. So this is on top of their academic commitments. And each student produces a journal to document her work. And then the program culminates in a small exhibition each spring to showcase the student's work. So the frames are reunited with their original paintings and hung, and the students' processes and tools are on display. And these exhibitions are always called Framework, and then the number, Restoring the Boundaries. So this is a little bit of an older image. I think we're up to Framework 9 or something by now. Um, and it's just in terms of like, results of the experience that these students have, I think similar to the SME program, um, they're both very intensive learning experiences, um, this one in particular in the science of art and in the creation of an exhibition. And we're finding that many of the students who develop conservation as a career interest are having success finding conservation jobs right out of college, which is pretty remarkable. So with these two programs, um, we now, in, in recent years, have created the opportunity to tie them actually into the Smith curriculum through a program called the Museum's Concentration. So the Museum's Concentration is sort of like a museum studies minor, which effectively integrates academic use with experiential learning. And it creates a bridge between the classroom and the co-curricular activity and 
gives students the opportunity to reflect on the connections between their academic work and their practical experiences. So there are some required courses for the museum's concentration and then there are required practical experiences which can be um, different kinds of internships, two of which are could be the SME program or the FRAME program. Um, so essentially allows students to get credit for this volunteer work and I believe tomorrow morning our director Jessica Nickel might be speaking a little bit more about this program. So um, to move on to the next kind of section, examples of programs, and under the header headline of museum as hub for student voices. So we recognize students as our primary constituents and we really aim to bring them into our working processes, especially when we're working with an issue that's relevant to their lives as students or as human beings. So the first example is called Student Picks, and this is a curatorial program. It's a sweepstakes program in which students enter into a raffle and anyone can enter into it, and a student is chosen to curate an exhibition of works on paper on view for one afternoon only, and this happens monthly during the academic year. Um, on the left is a postcard advertising the program in case you're having trouble seeing it, it says, if the artworks were in your hands, what would you do with them? This is your chance to find out. Student picks, your choice, your vision, your show. So any student on campus, regardless of her familiarity with art or the museum, can be involved in this way. And the student chooses around a dozen or more works on paper under a theme and is present for her exhibition to greet visitors and she also writes an introductory text. So on the right is an image of a student who's actually with us today. Um, and she's a senior and her show is called Conceal, Reveal, the Exquisite Art of Masking and Costuming. Okay, so the second program here is ID Tags, which is an education program. And ID Tags are an ongoing series of supplemental labels for objects on view in the permanent collection. And they are written by small groups of Smith faculty, staff, and students who are invited to come together to think about artworks through the lens of a theme, such as race or childhood or body image, and to write an ID tag that is rooted in what they know and who they are. And these labels provide a signed, definitive voice in contrast to the anonymous museum label. Um, on the left, you see an installation view of our Gaston Lachaise garden figure, which never fails to provoke giggles from <laughs> K through 12 visitors and grown-ups, I have to say sometimes. Um, but on the right, we see an example of an ID tag. You can sort of see how it's hung above the curatorial chat label, and there's a closer view of it. So the theme that year was body image, and a student wrote an ID tag. She sort of wanted to kind of critique this artist's view of women. So that's what her tag is about. So my final example of co-curricular programming shows a way that the museum has tapped into existing campus programming for students and worked in a collaborative way. Um, and that's called the Hot Seat. The Hot Seat is a chapel-sponsored ethics panel that seeks to engage the Smith community in consideration of real-life ethical problems. It's a moderated panel discussion that involves select faculty and students. And just to give an example of the museum's collaborative participation in a hot seat, we helped to organize a panel called Sugar, Food, and Fair Trade Ethics during an exhibition of work that we were having um, by Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, who's a Cub Cuban born artist whose work addresses sugar and the slave trade. And that semester she had an installation in the museum called Sugar. So we were able to kind of tap into that as part of our programming. Okay, so moving into sort of results or how do we see the benefits um, and results of investing in these co curricular programs? I think this is a statistic that must be attributed to both our academic and co-curricular programming because we do have um, very deep engagement by the faculty with our programs. Thank you to my colleagues who work on the academic programming side of things. But So at Smith, there's a sort of exit survey and we're able to obtain the results from that to learn that 
Um, and this has been, I think, the same for the past few years that it, students visit the museum at least once during their four years at Smith, and many of them visit many, many more times. So um, the museums really, they're coming. They're coming to visit us. And so, um, so what, the way that we look at the, the experiential learning piece is that that's where we can grab onto the visitors, bring them in tighter, and really get them very, very involved. So um, many students talk about just feeling really comfortable in the museum. They feel ownership of the museum if they've participated in one of these co-curricular programs. And some of them refer to themselves as the museum groupies or so. So just this idea of ownership and having a good time at the museum and that, that that's OK and they feel that the museum is a place where they can have fun, but where it's also a place to learn. Um, so really, our co-curricular programming, it's, it's really not about getting students to come in. They're coming, but it's about the depth of experience, the continued exposure to art, and the guidance by the staff that they receive by participating in these programs. And um, to wrap up, I just want to share an oral evaluation, which should play out loud, I hope. Um, that I do each year of the Student Museum Educator Program where I ask the students to go into a room by themselves. I'm not there to prompt them or anything and there are a few questions that I ask them to respond to into a microphone and one of those questions is, how is SME relevant to your Smith education? Because I'm curious, I want to hear what they have to say. So I put together about a minute or so clip. During my student education, a lot of my learning has taken place outside of the classroom. This new program has allowed me not only to cultivate my critical visual skills, which is helping me on my path of study as an art history major, but also my public speaking ability, which will be important as I embark on my career. The program has been such a great de-stressor in a sense because of a really friendly environment. The staff encourages a relaxed environment. is a really nice break from a lot of the work that you're doing in other classes. The SME program has been an extremely influential part of my education at Smith College. It's actually one of the main reasons I chose to come to Smith. I came in knowing I was going to be an art history major, and I then applied for the museum's concentration. And one of the experiences that really enriched that was the SME program. A lot of times when I'm creating tours, when I'm actually looking at the art, I can bring that into my classes where I have to think critically, use that kind of visual inventory skills to really look at something. This has been very relevant to my Smith education because I'm a studio art major and talking about art with other people helps me to talk about and understand my own art. So I'm very happy that we have the museum's concentration and the SME program and it has definitely further cemented my desire and passion to become involved in the museum's world. Okay. So just ultimately I think, you know, my final point is that we like this. We like our white box with our beautiful installations, but we like this a lot better. So there's an image of a recent student program. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, and I think that that's important to, it's important, the reason we all wanted to sort of introduce our institutions is it really informs the, what we're responding to, of course, as museum educators and um, the unique opportunities we have in the specific context of our specific places. So these are some of the uh, art museum's stats. Our annual attendance is approximately 225,000, and 30,000 of that, um, and we have a 30,000 attendance for our educational programs across all areas, and of that 30,000, about 9,000 are students. Um, of the professional staff of 40, 5.3, I love those numbers, um, <laughs> are working across four areas. So this is shared among six individuals in the department, teaching and learning, public programs, student engagement, and we also work on interpretation and exhibitions. And um, there's a lot of uh, overlap between all of those areas. And so even though we have staff sort of defined with uh, working in each of those areas, um, it's not always so clear cut, as you will see. So beginning in 2006, uh, UMA closed its doors for three years for about a $40 million renovation and expansion, which more than doubled our exhibition space. So we're now about 100,000 square feet. And in addition to exhibition space, it gave us new programming spaces, um, centrally scheduled classrooms, object and paper study rooms for faculty, their classes and visiting scholars, and a curatorial research center library uh, staffed by our registrarial department. Both my position as well as the education coordinator for public programs and student engagement grew out of this. Um, expansion at UMA and so I know one of the things that Leslie was particularly interested in was the fact that we have a position which is dedicated to uh, co-curricular student engagement it's not a hundred percent of what she does every year um, but depending on the time of the year and what's going on I would say it ranges from 50 to 80 percent of, um, of what she's focusing on. And, and key within that is the oversight of our student programming and advisory council, which also was an outgrowth of the renovation and expansion. When we reopened the building, the council was formed um, in advance of that to help us plan for how would we reopen for students. And in fact, in the week long of 24 seven activities to reopen the building for the university and the town, reopening for the students was the first of those very special events. So that's sort of the basic background. And I want to um, talk a little bit about this idea that this is sort of, I think, inherent in all of our institutions. Um, but, it, but it's very explicit in the way we talk and think about what we're doing in the education department at UMA. And I think it's important for us in part because at such a large institution, what's happening at the bottom is also really important. So not to imply a hierarchy necessarily, um, but, but breadth is really important for us. So we have these really large scale events that bring in thousands of students every year. And um, often, you know, maybe that's the only time they come. Those students come one to, th we kind of estimate one to three times in their, you know, in their college career. And then all the way up to the top where you have the really more in-depth experiences, you know, much like some of the things that Julie was describing. And more and more what we are, um, this is an image from Artscapade, which is a, a welcome week event for incoming freshmen. So over 4,000 freshmen come through our doors and it's just this sort of wild and uh, crazy, <laughs> crazy time. And this is a picture of our student programming and advisory council. Um, so I think what I wanna really focus on today is the idea of co-creation. That's what we're, we've been calling co-creation. And I think it was touched on a little bit in some of the discussions this morning about participatory models for how to engage with students. Um, and I think at, the, at UMA, we're moving more and more 
toward this model where we are leveraging student, both undergraduate and graduate, uh, as well as faculty participation in the creation of programs that are then also enjoyed by the public. I think as a state institution, you know, we feel very keenly the need to be a resource for the public at large. Their tax dollars are paying for us to be there. So this is my first example. This was um, a project that was initiated by the Center for Sexual Awareness and Prevention at U of M. It was their 25th anniversary, and the director came to us um, to talk about ways in which we might collaborate. The themes of the anniversary were teaching, leading, and healing, and she really felt strongly that um, engaging with art would be a way for people to think about those, those ideas in a different way. And she wanted to kind of move the conversation beyond um, ideas of victimhood to really talk about what are um, healthy relationships. And so kind of, again, to this morning's conversation about what are the sources for common values and that that conversation could be had more easily and in a different way around works of art. So um, she worked with our curator for museum teaching and learning with our student docent core to really talk about what those themes meant. And then the student docent core went um, into our, the works in our collection that were on view to select particular works that they had a personal response to um, around the themes of teaching, leading, and healing. And so the objects and then uh, labels that the student docents wrote, which were really more personal responses than they were necessarily art historical information, um, all culminated in what was an online exhibition, Paths to Renewal. Uh, so this is a great example of collaborating with another campus department. Um, also, I think a good example of the process by which it came about, kind of modeling then for the public ways in which um, their own paths of inquiry where that could take them and, and, and the sort of value of um, very personal responses to art. I'm going to skip this one for now and maybe come back to it, but for the sake of time. Um, so then my next example is when we were um, planning for this panel, we talked a lot about the balance that we all seek to strike between educational, I always say educational with capital E, um, and the social, which I say is educational with a lowercase e. Um, and so this is in some ways more to the social side. However, I think it's a great example. It's, it's really a hybrid. So this was the Fluxus and the Essential Questions of Life exhibition, which um, Juliet and Leslie know, and anybody at the Hood know well because it originated here. And we actually modeled a lot of our programming off of what you know was inspired by ideas that we, of what Dartmouth did here, what the Hood did here. Um, so we were working in the residence halls. We were working with um, faculty in the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, faculty in the History of Art, their classes, um, our student council all to create the um, programs that were then made available to students and to the broader public. So it was you know, built in part and parcel to some of the courses taking place on campus. And then it also was something that was you know, um, really just you know, these, these performances, public performances, just trying to engage the campus and the town you know, overall. So students and faculty worked with um, Ben Patterson was a, one of the original Fluxus artists, came to Ann Arbor and did a residency with us. So they worked with him to create a performance called um, the Fluxus String and Water Compendium, which was an evening of, little, of Fluxus performances um, that students and faculty all performed in. We did the Wounded Furniture uh, piece in the residence halls, and that on the top left is so there were five residence halls that participated, and one of the works was chosen to be in the gallery. And that actually is, was the second time that a student project was on display in our exhibition galleries. That's not 
part of what UMA does. We don't do student shows. The School of Art and Design has many gallery spaces where that happens. So for us in the education department, that felt like a real victory. Another collaboration in the, um, this is with the uh, School of Music, Theater, and Dance on campus, and this is an eight concert series that happens every year, and it is site-specific to UMA, so it always is connected with the ex an exhibition or with an artist or idea that's part of our collection. And it's developed with faculty and students. Um, each, each concert is sort of unique unto itself in terms of what concept it's dealing with, um, it's not the typical, uh, took place at the same time, from the same time period, kind of uh, direct link to, you know, what, what's in the exhibition. It tends to be, um, like for example, we had, a, we had an exhibition of Chinese woodblock prints and we did this woodcuts um, concert that was a concert all of different repertoire that is played on wooden instruments. So, you know, kind of thinking about what are all the different kinds of things you could do with wood had a corollary to the variety of prints that were in the exhibition. But it's not like you necessarily learned more about that culture or that time period or, you know, sort of the, the um, art historical part of it. So again, this is another example where we're working with faculty and students, they're performing together, that doesn't usually happen as part of their normal curriculum, um, and creating a concert series that the public then comes to enjoy and experiences the art on view in different ways. So now I'm turning a little bit to the work of the Student Advisory Council. This is a picture of the annex, which is our student blog. And the idea to have a student blog in the first place, what came from our council. Um, and they, we had kind of invited them to think about different ways and different projects where they could really be developers of the content and the voice of the museum. And so they wanted to start a blog. And so we launched it in conjunction with this exhibition, Face of Our Time, which was five different photographers working around the world. Um, called Face of Our Time that SF MoMA did. And so we said, what is the face of our time to you? And it was a student photography competition. 20 finalists were selected by our student programming and advisory council. And then the curator of the show actually selected the three winners. And this was actually, this preceded Fluxus. This was the first time that we had a student project in the gallery. So in the education space of the gallery, the, the finalists were, um, there was a slideshow on a monitor. So again, something that we were really excited about. Um, other things that the council does includes um, devising programs um, that connect with our exhibitions that they think will be particularly of interest to other students. They do a lot of outreach for us and they also have this great opportunity to interview visiting artists and curators and then the interviews are posted, their audio files that are then posted um, on the annex. So then, this is my final example, and I will wrap up. Um, this is another example where we kind of are working in the digital realm and leveraging the possibilities of technology to reach a broad audience. Um, and again, using sort of in the, using, let's see, what do I want to say? It's, they're examples of multimedia interpretation and having um, students and community members work with us to create responses to works of art that are then made available through, in this case, the dialogue table, which is that big glowing orb <laughs> on the top left. Um, the dialogue table is an interactive table located at UMA where um, the whole collection of what's on view in our, in our collections galleries is available on the table. And so lots of different relationships can be discovered um, kind of breaking down the sort of traditional way that we organize our collections galleries by geography and time period. They all are in conversation with one another here on this table. Um, and we just recently received a grant from the NEA and the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan to, um, for the first time, bring multimedia interpretation into our galleries. Uh, we just had Wi-Fi installed. We have finally entered the 21st century. 
Um, and so many of the movies that were initially created for the table will now be available in the galleries, and we've been able over the past year then to expand this model um, where we've worked with the original dialogue table movies were created with people that we chose, faculty, scholars, artists, writers, filmmakers. Um, and then we sort of expanded on that where we worked with um, different filmmaking classes at the University of Michigan. So students did receive credit um, and created these short responses to works of art in the collection. And then we've now expanded on that to invite the community in. And they, it's called Many Voices, and it's launching in about 10 days. <laughs> We're very excited. Um, but again, this idea of modeling, there's all these different ways in which one might respond to works of art, and there's no right way to respond. And, um, and so putting that all on view in the galleries is very exciting for us. The final thing I want to say, and I know I think I'm over time, um, I think all of these things are examples um, in addition to ways in which we're leveraging sort of the brain trust of the university for a broader public engagement. Um, also that we kind of think about the opportunity to work in these new ways with people as sort of the education department as a laboratory. And I don't know if others of you have similar experiences, but we find that because we are sort of on the front lines of working with students and the public, that we are often working in new ways and then pushing the rest of the institution to work in that way too. So the student blog is the first and only blog at UMA, but I hear other people talking about other kinds of blogs. Um, we um, were the first to sort of launch uh, the UMA Facebook page and it used to be part of the student outreach initiative, but now it is owned by the communications department. Um, we are the first department to have a video intern for the purposes of creating these multimedia interpretation projects. And now they, uh, my colleagues in the curatorial department keep tapping on my shoulder asking if they can borrow him to document the installation of the contemporary galleries or things like that. So I think it's really interesting, this idea of participatory co-creation, the way we collaborate together as these little experiments that then propel us forward uh, to the next thing. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, Lisa. She's covering for my technical incapability. <laughs> This is the first time I've done a PowerPoint. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, the uh, RISD Museum was founded together. Can everybody hear me? Okay. The RISD Museum was founded together with the Rhode Island School of Design in 1877 by a group of women who returned from the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition with extra funds. I think it was about $1,600. And I love that story that we were founded by women. The museum itself was initially modeled on the South Kensington Museum and evolved into a virtually encyclopedic collection now housing over 86,000 objects including painting, sculpture, decorative arts, costume, furniture, and other works of art from every part of the world, with objects from ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome, and art of all periods from Asia, Europe, and the Americas, up to the latest contemporary art. And I just can't read, oh, back. Can't read just showing you, this is Manet's Le Repos, it's one of the, sort of the hallmarks of our collection. We have a great collection of uh, Impressionist art. This is one of our Towns and Goddard de desks that was given to us by Charles Pendleton in 1904, and was sort of the core of our wonderful collection of American furniture. And here's, oh, sorry, too fast. And here's a glorious Benin head. And I did want to show this is our 20th century gallery, which we recently reinstalled to mix design and fine art, uh, sort of in the spirit of RISD, and it's very, been very well received by our RISD colleagues. 
Currently, we have a staff of 63 professionals and 24 security guards. We have six curatorial departments, ancient art, contemporary art, costume and textiles, decorative arts, painting and sculpture, and prints, drawings, and photographs. The education department has eight full-time and two part-time members and is organized largely according to audience, academic programs, that's me, family and youth programs, public programs, school and teacher programs, and gallery and digital interpretation. Our annual visitorship is a little over 100,000 uh, 100, people. Um, last fall, 192 classes came either to visit the galleries or to use the classrooms. That represents, uh, those are RISD classes, 3,435 students, and the school has around 2,300 undergraduate and graduate students. In addition, we are the art museum for the Southeast New England region, and so we had class visits, 42 class visits from Brown University last fall, that's 689 students, and 38 classes, 607 students and faculty from other colleges in the region. RISD faculty and students have membership privileges in the museum. And Brown University, our next door neighbor, actually right up the hill, uh, has historically maintained an institutional membership. And we recently expanded our institutional memberships to, in to include other universities and colleges in the region. And the membership is based on the size of the student body. And so now members include Bryant University, Community College of Rhode Island, Providence College, Rhode Island College, and Roger Williams University. And then to finish off our statistics, two of our departments have open hours, uh, costume and textiles and works on paper. Both the, the objects can't be on view for a very long time. So they have open hours and our uh, Prince drawings and photographs had 84 students visit last year, last fall, and costume and textiles had 62. Okay, I'll get to that. The historic mission of the Rhode Island School of Design included among its objectives the general advancement of public art education by the exhibition of works of art and art school studies and by lectures in art. The museum's mission statement builds on that concept. Distinguished by its relationship to Rhode Island School of Design, the museum educates and inspires artists, designers, students, scholars, and the general public through exhibitions, programs, and publications. More specifically, our new interpretive plan places emphasis on the creative process. Through exhibitions, programs, and media, we invite engagement with all aspects of creative making. As such, the museum makes RISD transparent to the public and offers RISD students and faculty an avenue for sharing their process. Um, the RISD, I hate to repeat laboratory, but the, the museum was also RISD's laboratory and a place for curricular as well as co-curricular uh, innovation. And I show this bench, it comes from a recent furniture design class that focused on museum seating and resulted in the museum's acquisition of three student design benches, one of which is here. More traditionally, uh, RISD students copy in the galleries. Uh, and now one painting class is, includes a requirement to copy. I must say that in the past two years, this has increased. Uh, for about 10 years, we had no copyists, and it's, for some reason, it's coming back, and there's also a Brown class who has been copying as well. Uh, they've been copying from images, because for us, copying is reserved for RISD students. It's sort of labor-intensive for us to set up for it. Um, frankly, in our programming, we have not emphasized the distinction between curricular and co-curricular. 
rather, in my view, choosing to focus on access and innovation to create varied opportunities for RISD and regional college students. We do have many work-study opportunities for RISD students. Those jobs go very quickly. In addition, each year, five RISD students um, who are concentrators, that is, a RISD concentrator is sort of a minor in history of art and visual culture, receive semester credit for working in a curatorial department. And six RISD grad students, excuse me, uh, receive a stipend for working in the museum de departments. It may be cura curatorial, it may be installation, it may be working with our designer. And also Brown's History of Art Department has uh, funds two graduate students to work in curatorial departments in the museum. And in addition, we run a summer internship program which is paid and part-time, which is open to college students in the region and beyond. This year we had 79 applicants for eight positions. But today I want to focus on several, which I've learned are now co-curricular programs, uh, that highlight the museum's association with the school and re regional colleges. They all offer various avenues for students to share their talents with the public. Several years ago, we began asking RISD students to man what we call process carts on our late Thursdays to introduce our public to materials and processes and to RISD student artists. The carts are stationed in galleries where like historical objects are displayed. The students bring in their tools, materials, and examples of finished work to elucidate the various stages in their process. We ask them as well to reflect upon the continuity and or changes in the practices of making. Here we see Sakura Brady from textile design and Elise Pelletier of apparel design who collaborated to create a new textile pattern and garment inspired by textiles, <coughs> excuse me, on view in the 20th century. They explain their design process and at least models the final garments. <clears throat> Sorry. Excuse me. <coughs> As you see, <clears throat> this is a. Sorry. As you see, this is a drop-in conversation between visitors and students. More intimate than a formal demonstration and a chance for one-on-one -on -one conversations about making. Three years ago, we started our gallery lecture program um, modeled on Yale's gallery guide program. <clears throat> we invite regional college students to apply to join the program to give poor, short public tours on topics of their own choosing. The students who commit to at least two years of participation receive training in the fall and winter and gives tours to the public in, uh, afterwards. Our, our, our participants include students, both graduate and undergraduate, from RISD, Brown, Providence College, Community College of Rhode Island, and Roger Williams University. <coughs> Sorry, it's a recurring frog, I guess. Their majors have included architecture, engineering, public humanities, Egyptology, and textiles, among others. Here, for example, Emily Russo, a Brown graduate student in Egyptology and Western Asian Studies at Brown, is leading her tour on Memento Mori. The tours are generally given on late Thursday nights, last half an hour, and focus on just three or four objects that the students choose according to their preferred theme, death in this case. <laughs> it's a lovely tour, really. <laughs> but she's an Egyptologist. And <clears throat> 
the students are encouraged to discuss the theme in relation to their academic interests, be it iconography or process or cultural context. The students also serve as advisors on student programming and help us get the word out to their communities. Uh, and this brings up an issue. I found that communication with student, uh, students changes just about every year. One year I can use email. That's out. Then they want posters. That's out. Then it, so you have to keep up with the students as to what they're reading so they understand, know what's coming up at the museum. <clears throat> and the uh, college night, there are process carts and gallery lecturers and a range of performances and art making activities come together for a twice annual college night designed for regional college students. Here you see our grand gallery with the RISD a cappella group singing, drawing on paper cloths. Other events might include showing student films, student performances, drop-in workshops. Uh, on these evenings, we typically get 600 to 800 attendees. Finally, there is our annual sightings competition. Here you see Nafis White and Garcia Sinclair, both sophomores in sculpture this year. Just after they installed their sculpture, Waiting for Godot, a meditation on the pink triangle and the gradual acceptance of LGBT marriage. RISD students naturally want to see their work in the museum. I get requests for this all the time. Since 1995, the museum has invited students to submit proposals for site-specific in installations that comment on the museum's collections and or spaces in a jury competition. The winning submissions receive a prize of $300 and implementation funds of 1,000 and is funded by the Artist Development Fund of the Rhode Island Foundation. We generally invite an artist, often a RISD graduate or an artist currently exhibiting in the museum, to jury the competition. This year it was Alejandro Diaz, who has an installation that's also a comment on the museum in our ground floor gallery. The call for proposals goes out in September, with a deadline around the third week in October. The winning installations are our view during the spring semester through commencement. In the process, the students are given a list of museum sites, both interior and exterior, which can vary from year to year. Sites are usually transitional spaces. This year we had two bridges, a two-story staircase, and this exterior uh, bit of lawn outside of, on our Benefit Street entrance. The pro proposal form includes a lot of no's, no open flame, no live plants or animals, no hanging from the ceilings, and so forth. We also provide site tours with museum sa staff to explain what is possible at each specific site, access to electricity, wall composition for attachment, and more. As I tell the students on the tour, they will he hear a lot of no's, but that is because the list is shorter and their creativity and imagination can find ways to overcome our prohibitions, and they usually do. Each proposal includes a statement on materials and implementation and another on the aesthetics as well as a budget and examples of previous work. Students may submit more than one proposal and collaborations are encouraged. One year we had a student who won for two collaborations. We usually receive about 30 proposals which are reviewed for technical feasibility by museum staff. Those comments are sent to the juror along with the proposals. The juror then selects four to eight finalists to interview and chooses the two winning proposals. The winning students have roughly two months to realize their projects and that length of time can be dangerous as artists are constantly innovating and rethinking. After the, the students are notified that they won, I also inform their department head. Uh, we have learned to require that any substantive change be approved both by the juror and museum staff. 
And we have also learned to schedule a studio visit to assure that things are going as planned and resolve any outstanding problems. Uh, this, is, this is a continuous collaboration, even as they're preparing their proposals, they're getting in touch with me to find out, can I use this material? Can I use this kind of fastener to the wall? It's a continuous dialogue all the way through to implementation. Um, this is uh, Lindsay Caron, who's installing her uh, current piece, uh, Mariner's Compass, in our glass bridge. Uh, the actual, actual installation period is very short, usually two and a half days during standing working hours, and the students receive up to 16 man hours of installation staff assistance. They, as a result, they're encouraged to do as much as possible in their studios, which is why we do insist on the studio visit. Um, <clears throat> Lindsay, in this case, composed her piece from reused plastic bags, which she carefully selected for color, then ironed, cut into a pattern, and sewed uh, to form the piece. And she selected the theme of the mariner's compass, surrounded by signal flags, to evoke Rhode Island as the ocean state. This installation was labor intensive. Um, I can say, she was late. She got it done right under the wire, just at five o'clock. And she p pulled in the other two sightings winners to help her install, and even a, a sculpture uh, professor came by to give her assistance. From inception to realization, the sightings competition introduces the students to the practices of professional museums, usually more exacting than student galleries. Over the years, we've had a range of wonderful installations, and here I'll show you some other winning projects. <clears throat> Column in 2010 by Lee Johnson and Ben Pe Peterson, okay, uh, was a wonderful droll um, take on the museum's architecture and translucent facade that same year by Celeste Wilson in, uh, in the glass department, actually overlooking the glass building, was another, uh, and actually they've made a video of the making of that which they used to recruit new students. We have found engaging student voices in art in our galleries has enlightened our audience and is making the creative process, both art making and art interpretation, transparent to visitors. An academic art museum serving uh, an art school and, and as well as liberal arts colleges and research universities in the region. Um, <clears throat> these programs make the interaction transparent to the public and offer the students a public role in the life of the museum. Thank you. Okay, I will, um, I'll begin by just giving you the, the quick lowdown on um, my uh, museum. I um, am at the Tang Teaching Museum at Skidmore Campus. Um, Skidmore is a small liberal arts college with a student body of 2,400, um, and we have 248 full-time faculty. Uh, the Tang gets about 40,000 visitors each year, and that's a mixture of Skidmore community, faculty, staff, and students, as well as K through 12 school visits and regional um, visitors and, and visitors from beyond. Um, the museum is 39,000 uh, square feet, and as you can see in the images, um, was designed to kind of reflect the ideas of reaching out um, in sort of branching out into the campus and the community beyond, um, and also being a place where uh, different ways of thinking and seeing can come together, a kind of bridge or laboratory, sorry to use that yet again, um, of interdisciplinarity. Um, the museum opened in 2000, so we're a relatively young museum, um, and I think that in that time we've been very influential in um, leading and shaping the, the way that Skidmore College um, thinks about object-based learning and um, in, engages in um, sort of new ways of, of thinking about the use of a, of a college museum. 
As my uh, fellow panelists have been doing, I want to frame our co-curricular programming in terms of the museum's mission and to emphasize that what we do with student engagement of all types is fundamentally tied to the core activities and mission of the museum. So our goal is to, uh, quote, foster inter interdisciplinary thinking and to promote, quote, active and collaborative learning. Those are quotes right out of the mission statement. Um, so the emphasis on interdisciplinary thinking and uh, on collaborative learning are articulated very clearly right in the mission of the museum. It's also worth noting that although we have a, a wonderful and healthy sized permanent collection, um, the museum does not install that collection in permanent collection galleries. In other words, we don't have any place where um, we have long term installations of our collection. All of our galleries um, uh, contain continually rotating exhibitions um, so that pretty much all of our co-curricular engagement is based on this continually changing set of references as kind of a moving target. Um, we have to be really flexible and I think our size allows us to do that. I think it gives us the ability to be um, flexible to, to create a range uh, in terms of the scale and the type of engagement that we create um, to con continually be innovating, um, evolving and collaborating in new and different ways. Um, so in addition to interdisciplinarity and collaboration or co-creation, um, and, and by that I mean really students, although um, among, they're among others as well, faculty for example, um, are really helping to originate and design uh, programs. So there's a, a shared ownership that's really essential and um, at the heart of what we do. And we're also interested in creating breadth and depth in our student engagement. So reaching as wide a cross section of students as we possibly can, while also making sure that there are opportunities for students to become very deeply involved with the museum. We also think um, that there's a real kind of fluidity between what we, our curricular and our co-curricular programs. Um, our educators, of which we have two, um, are um, doing both. Where, um, uh, you know, many of the events that we create are designed to be integrated into courses, um, but to exist at the same time um, as uh, places for a very mixed kind of audience to come together, an audience of students, faculty, staff, the public. Um, so that leads me to my other point is a diversity of audience is really important to us. Um, so that a lot of the work that we do with students has to do with creating programming that's designed to appeal to a broad um, mixture of audiences and to have all of those different perspectives and different voices in the room together exchanging um, ideas. Um, somewhere along here I skipped that we have a staff of, a full-time staff of 16, um, so I don't want to forget to say that. Um, I want to focus on two uh, elements uh, of our co-curricular engagement. One is student employment and the other is programming for exhibitions. Um, so I'll start with um, student employment. Um, we really emphasize a deep and collaborative experience with our students. So we treat our student employees much like you might treat um, an intern. Um, we make very little distinction between our employees and our interns. It's important that they, our employees, are helping us to get the daily work of the museum done, but we also try to develop really strong personal relationships and to provide opportunities for student employees to have a mentored experience that's going to really serve them well as they move beyond the museum and then beyond Skidmore. Um, we want it to be providing skills. We want um, them to be skills that can be applied broadly. Um, on average, we have about 18 students working for us each semester, and they mainly are working in our curatorial, education, collections, graphic design, and digital media areas. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about um, some of the programs that come out of education. Um, Stewart, uh, our students create viewer guides that act as a learning tool for other audiences. Um, each exhibition has a viewer guide, and uh, stu the students make them um, uh, on their own, obviously with guidance from staff, um, but then the viewer guide is a way for uh, other audiences to be able to um, get a handle on some of the ideas in the exhibitions and um, use that as a way to, um, to learn more about what's happening in the exhibitions. Students um, help develop they prototype the art projects. They run the, front, uh, the art projects on our Family Saturdays program, which is um, essentially groups of families and uh, you know, parents and, and children coming into the museum um, 
studying, having a, a short time studying a work or an exhibition, and then going and making art um, around that theme, idea, or work of art that they've been looking at. Um, and our students uh, create our Thursday night programs. And this is a really great example of how um, we, we've taken a program that um, began as a staff idea and made it into uh, a really uh, an example of co-creation and shared ownership. The students really take this uh, program and run with it. So every Thursday night we are open late. That's something I'm sure some night of the week that many of you um, do. But our Thursday night events are organized by our students. Um, we try to find students to work um, in the education department who have a lot of academic um, diversity, are bringing different interests and different knowledge bases um, to bear on the creation of these programs. Um, each student chooses an exhibition to create an event around. So each of them takes ownership over one event and then of course they all help each other um, with all of them. But um, this way a student is really uh, looking at an exhibition very carefully. They're thinking about what the themes are, what the ideas are, um, what they want to maybe draw out and, and amplify through an event. Um, and the other thing is that they reach out to their fellow students. So they reach out to other student groups on campus and collaborate with those groups. Um, so we're cultivating in this way, I think, a very student-friendly environment uh, that leads to students feeling very connected to the museum um, and have a feeling of belonging regardless of what their um, academic focus might be. And then they, of course, become ambassadors um, that bring in additional audiences. So I'm going to give you two specific examples here real quickly. Um, our student McKenna took um, our dance draw exhibition that was up in the fall. Um, and decided she wanted to create um, a guided walkthrough of the exhibition that she led, um, followed by a panel discussion uh, around issues that she saw um, in the exhibition about representations of the female body. Um, she invited the panelists and she chose a, a, a nice range of faculty uh, members. There's uh, people from the studio department, the dance department, gender studies program, and then on the end, on the far end, are McKenna and a fellow um, student from the education department named Christina, who are also um, panelists. Uh, another example is uh, something that Christina uh, originated uh, around our Terry Adkins exhibition, which was also in the fall, uh, called Recital, and her event was called the Downbeat Cafe. So she was drawing out some of the themes that she saw in Terry's work around music, musicians, and the history of, of um, uh, African American musicians, sort of underrepresented or underappreciated musicians. Um, and she uh, invited student musicians to come and perform in the, um, in the uh, museum. Uh, so there's a wide range of different kinds of music happening. Um, and then, and you can see Terry is there in the back with the red scarf, um, enjoying the music. And then they also um, decided that they were going to make it a, a sort of a, a cafe, and they designed these wonderful non-alcoholic mixed drinks. Um, each one focused on a, one of the um, artists that Terry was create, one of the musicians that Terry was creating work around, um, so that there was a, um, you know, a. Uh, one on Lightning Hopkins, there was a drink uh, dedicated to Jimi Hendrix. I think the drink was called Purple Haze. Um, there was a, a drink about Bessie Smith. Um, and so um, essentially what these students are doing with the guidance from our staff is they're, they're thinking about the exhibitions, they're drawing out themes, um, they're doing something that's fun and appealing to their fellow students. They're making interdisciplinary connections. Um, in curatorial, I just want to briefly touch on something that we do with our student employees, um, which is about um, exhibition making. Um, I do a lot of curricular exhibition making with students, uh, class curatorial projects, senior honors projects, internships for credit that result in, in exhibitions. But this example is, and, there, and we do a number of them every year, is a curatorial student project that's not connected to any class or credit. Um, but it's an example of the way that we try to create some real depth for our students who are working for us in the curatorial department. Um, so in addition to helping us with the major shows that we're, that we're working on, they get um, a project of their own. And we ask them to go into the permanent collection, to explore it, to propose an exhibition, um, to write the labels, to organize the installation, 
um, and to um, give a gallery talk. So really from the beginning to the end, they have complete ownership over this exhibition. Um, and it's a really rich and deep experience for them. This is a show by a student named Alec, who was actually a classics major, decided he wanted to be a curator. And um, so uh, the show is called Twisted Domestic. Here he and I are discussing um, the installation of some of the uh, work that was in the show. Um, quickly, I'll tell you about uh, the Student Voices blog. We have a blog that we use as another way to create some depth and, um, and conversation within our student employees. Um, it's really also an example of how engagement at the Tang is something that every staff measure, member is encouraged to innovate around. It's not something that just comes exclusively out of the education department or out of the curatorial department. Um, the blog was an idea that was developed by our um, digital media person and it's now something that all of the employees do as part of their job um, to contribute to the blog and to um, provide a space where they can hear what each other are doing in the museum and also where um, the, the, the greater world can see what they're up to. Okay, so I want to talk about this exhibition, We the People, as a case study for co-curricular programming around exhibitions. Um, this was an interdisciplinary collaborative project that I worked on um, with Skidmore faculty, started with as a government professor wanting to do a show about the Constitution, and it evolved to inc include a whole group of faculty and students who helped us to create the programming around this. And what makes this, um, and we do this kind of thing for all our exhibitions, but this one in particular was really intensive and deep and, um, and full because we decided that we would make this show not so much an object-based show, but an exhibition about enacting the ideas that the show was, um, was trying to get across. Here's two of the three works that were in the show. So the show was basically just three works of art that created a setting or a context for activity and the real energy was the things that were happening, um, enacting the ideas of what does it mean to constitute uh, communities, what does it mean to be an engaged citizen, um, what does it mean to participate in our you know, democratic experiment. So we had all of this input, we put the word out, we just told everybody this is a space for you, come and do something in here, have a dialogue, have a discussion, have your meeting, whatever. And um, so I'm just going to show you a few of the, well, here's some of the posters for the some, but not all of the many things that happened in this space. Um, it's an example of a collaboration with the Thursday night program. It's an example of, of blurring the lines between curricular and co-curricular -curic um, uh, pr programming, um, because many of the, our faculty use these um, events and um, use the space for their classes as well. So very quickly, student collaborations. Um, Student-led voter registration drive that was also a collaboration with the League of Women Voters. We registered over 150 students to vote in the fall election. Um, the Spanish Club asked us if they could do an informed voter panel. They organized it. The students are, on, are the panelists who are talking about what you need to know um, in order to make an informed decision in the fall election. Um, this student is a senior government major who did this um, workshop at the Roosevelt Institute and then came and did it for us. Um, and she's asking um, her millennial generation to get re-engaged with politics and, the, and policy making and not to feel excluded from it and how can we go about doing that. And there they are working on their problems. Um, and then uh, a student organization on campus uh, that's an AIDS awareness group um, wanted to bring a section of the AIDS quilt to campus. So we reinstalled the benches in the exhibition around um, a section of the AIDS quilt um, for Valentine's Day. Uh, faculty also organizing events and bringing in their students, bringing in the public, um, creating this wonderful mixture of kinds of audience that are all together sharing um, information, sharing knowledge. Um, so we had a city charter debate because Saratoga Springs was thinking about changing its form of government. Um, we had a school board meeting which could have been very ho-hum but on the agenda was questions of guns and gun violence um, and it was a, an incredibly heated and long um, uh, debate. Um, so the energy in the room was really just quite incredible. Um, so you know, the, and there were so many more examples. I have 
cut this thing down <laughs> incredibly um, it, to keep to my 15 minutes. Um, but examples um, that I've given you are, are intended to show um, us being responsive to the content of the exhibition, of us looking at um, co-creating these kinds of events with our student and faculty, of thinking interdisciplinarily, thinking about disciplinary connections, blending the curricular and the co-curricular. Um, and we do it because curricular engagement doesn't reach everyone. And we really want to give every Skidmore student the opportunity to engage with object-based learning. We know it's one of the most powerful and impactful ways to learn and to make connections between disciplines and to understand the world. Um, so um, we also want to foster lifelong connections to art, to museums, um, to the Tang. We want them to feel ownership. We want them to feel engaged. Um, and we want them to feel comfortable in the museum. Um, and I would just say that for us, the most important things are to be responsive, um, to be flexible, and to be tuned in to our students. Um, and, um, and then just kind of go with it because it's, you know, it's an ever-changing landscape. So thank you. I want to give a, just a huge thanks to the four panelists for the wide range of models and programs and ideas that they shared with us. So thank you all very, very, very much for that. Um, we started a little bit late and we ran a little bit late, so we're going to take just a couple minutes. Um, I wanted to just share a few reflections um, before we open up the floor uh, with microphones for questions or uh, things that you want to share. And so I just wanted to um, share a couple reflections on the value of co-curricular student engagement that have come up in the course of our conversations, and I think you may have, may have been clear in, in some of the presentations, but just um, to underscore a few things. As Rachel was just saying, one of the Tang's goals is to reach all students and to help all students engage with objects, understand how you can learn through art, um, and develop fundamental life skills that you can develop particularly through working with art. Across the board, student engagement um, helps build art, arts communities on the campus and throughout the campus. Uh, Co-curricular opportunities are often very appealing to students who may want to put a toe into the arts, but no, don't necessarily want to sign up to take an entire art class. And so this is a way that in a short amount of time they can have that kind of exposure. It is, as you've seen here, by nature participatory. It's free choice learning and students are not required to participate and it provides a wonderful forum th for the voices of students on the campus. I was thinking this morning as Anya Donovan was talking that another thing that provides is an opportunity for all of those stressed, depressed, and sleep deprived millennials to socialize and immerse themselves in creativity. Another thing to think about is that, is that if you limit your practice to curricular outreach, even if you do work with a wide range of disciplines, you're likely to miss out on connecting with a significant portion of your student body. And then a last connection I wanted to make is, as I was listening to David Helfand describe the human-oriented, welcoming, flexible classrooms that Quest University has designed, I thought about all the spaces uh, that you've just seen on the screen in these four museums. And one of the phrases that leapt to my mind this morning was unbounded learning spaces. Um, just the range of things that can happen through art and engagement with art and in these spaces that have very multiple and diverse uses. Um, and as he said, the recipe for learning is that you, it has to be active rather than passive. And I think we've really seen that very clearly here. So at this point, we're going to take um, just about, we have about eight minutes before we need to clear the room. Um, and we have uh, staff with microphones. And if anybody has questions for the panelists, or if anybody wants to share an example of student engagement at your museum that's different from what's been shared by the panelists, please, uh, we welcome you to speak up. So we have a couple hands going up over there. Hi, oh my goodness, that's really loud. <laughs> so, 
I'm used to speaking without a microphone in my gallery, so I spoke a little too loudly. I'm Jody Seasonwine. I'm the Mellon Curatorial Fellow for Academic Programs at the Princeton University Art Museum. And I was so inspired by all of the different examples the panelists provided. But one thing, just to sort of answer to Leslie, your command at the beginning was things that we may be doing we didn't hear. And one thing I didn't hear um, was uh, programming geared towards graduate students. And I know that many of your institutions are undergraduate focused, and so maybe that's not necessarily necessarily um, an audience that you serve, but at Princeton we have um, a small but you know, uh, very much active graduate school, and Princeton, although we're very proud of being halfway between New York and Philadelphia, we're kind of in the middle of nowhere when it comes to graduate student life. And so the graduate students who live on campus are looking for opportunities to socialize with their colleagues. And so we're trying to make the museum be more of a place for them to come and learn about not only what it's like to work in a museum, we have our traditional internship program, but offering them more sort of these co-curricular opportunities. And one that um, is on a very modest scale, I just wanted to throw out there as an example, as a program that we did um, this past year called Cocktails and Curators. And this responded directly to requests we had from students in the art history department to have, they want special opportunities, different from what we do for the undergraduates, to get to know the curators, get behind the scenes access. So on one of our late Thursdays, we had the graduate students come and had round robin um, sort of through the galleries where curators stayed late. And you know, with graduate students, you provide food, they will come. So we had food and drink, hence the cocktails portion. Uh, and the thing that surprised me the most was although the art history graduate students have requested that we do something like this. The majority of the students who came were from other departments. So there's a huge hunger out there on the part of graduate students who are, especially as they confront um, you know, the job market, are looking for other opportunities to expand their, their horizons. And so that was something we had about 100 students come and um, where we've been asked to do it again next fall. So that's something on a very modest scale, but to try and engage some of the graduate student population. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amanda Potter from the Wexner Center at um, Ohio State University. And I have kind of a question for the panel or whoever would like to respond, which is how we um, appeal to the unusual suspects. You know, I think we all, you know, there are the likely suspects that find their way to our institutions. And then there are the students that is completely outside of their conception about going to an art museum, what they would do there, how they'd behave, um, never mind the problem with kind of student employees and the ex expectation and the reality that a lot of these positions are unpaid. So how do you combat that and get in the students who, you know, are not the typical, um, you know, kind of stereotypical students? Well, I don't have a... Um I don't have a, a, a perfect answer to that question, but um, I know that with the, this exhibition, We the People, um, we got, we, the result of that was an enormous body of those unlikely suspects. Um, I had heard again and again that um, the students that were coming to these events, oh, I've, I've never been, I've never come here before, I've never, oh, this is so interesting how the art, connects with, you know, I mean, these are government majors, so many government majors. It was really interesting to me um, because they're very, once they're in the galleries, um, they, they were perfectly comfortable. They were perfectly at, at home. It's like, um, the, that's just that problem is just the getting in the door. After that, you don't really have to make an argument. Um, so I don't know, I think that um, thinking about the kinds of, for us, it's thinking about the kinds of exhibitions that we're doing, thinking about them in terms of the ways that they reach a broad interdisciplinary audience and how we can parlay the content of the exhibition into introducing new audiences. Um, I don't know, that's not a great answer, but. Um, I can speak to um, addressing an audience that's unusual suspects. One program that we have that's been very success successful at our museum, by the way, I'm Wendy Pyres, Curator of Education at the Trout Gallery at Dickinson College. Probably our most successful program that we have for bringing college students into the gallery is our language programming. We um, encourage language 
instructors and professors to bring their language classes into the gallery to have a discussion about exhibitions in the course language. And the discussions are led by my student interns who are either native speakers in a foreign language like you know, Spanish, French, Japanese, and or a um, senior graduating with a major in the language. Dickinson has a language requirement for graduation, so it slices across all disciplines and all majors. So we get a lot of unlikely suspects coming into the gallery to have a conversation about art with their language class. And it's true, once we have them in the door, it's not a problem. It's interesting, they come back, they appreciate the experience. It's just getting them in the door. And that program has increased our participation by college students or in college classes by about fivefold at our college. So it's been very successful. I think we have time for just one more brief question or comment, if anybody has one. I see a hand up here. Hi, I'm Ann Musser from Smith. So Julie, feel free to contradict anything I say. I was just gonna say that I think I'm understanding your question, Amanda, and from a couple of perspectives, one being about getting students who are not from the usual sort of disciplinary subjects. And there is a place where sort of building on what um, you just said, the, the range of our curricular courses influences a lot of who ends up feeling comfortable to come back on their own. The other piece, and this is, you know, I mean, I think exhibitions matter too, but another piece is um, thinking really carefully when you're hiring students to come in and thinking about how you're recruiting for internships in the museum because there's a diversity about who's our usual suspects in terms of discipline background, but then I, I know we're all really thinking a lot about diversity in terms of um, cultural, class, and racial backgrounds and trying to um, think really actively and proactively about how to continually diversify our students that way. Hopefully that <laughs> you agree with that. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for your contributions and I hope we'll continue the conversation uh, during the reception and during the dinner. I have just three quick announcements before we leave here. One is that somebody is missing their green tote bag that they left on the coat rack here. So if you look in your green tote bag that was given to you at the conference and it has a striped scarf in it that isn't yours, please return that tote bag uh, to the registration table and we can get it back to the, to the owner. We now have an hour long break before our reception begins at 5.30 in what's called the top of the hop. That's the second floor of the Hopkins Center that we've been walking through to get to the museum. And the easiest way to describe it is the top of the hop overlooks the Dartmouth Green, so it's the front of the building. But if after your break you need instructions, just find any uh, Hood staff member with a green uh, uh, ribbon attached or come to the registration table and people can direct you. The last thing we wanted to say is at dinner there will be assigned tables but not exactly assigned seats. So our dinner is going to be here in the ballroom and the reason we all need to exit swiftly in just a moment is so that they can transform this into our, our dinner venue. So when you come back there will be a table outside. You want to pick up your place card. It will tell you what your table number is and then you'll come in here. Thank you very, very much and we look forward to seeing you at the reception. Thank you.